Hey, good morning. Welcome to church. Man, it's good to be together, to worship the Lord together. Can we all stand? The scripture says in Psalms 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. God doesn't want you to forget who he's been to you and who he is to you. He says, the one who heals all your diseases, the one who forgives all your sins, the one who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. He satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And you know, it says this too. It says that God hasn't dealt with us according to our sins, and he hasn't punished us according to our iniquities. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful that... As far as from the east is from the west, God has removed our transgressions from us. It's all because of the cross. Aren't you thankful for his blood? Aren't you thankful for the cross, the resurrection? Jesus alone has saved us. Let's, will you bless him this morning? Will you worship him? Let's do that together. Come on. Come on, sing this together. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, and worship his holy name, and sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy And the sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. And whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name and sing like never before. Oh my soul, I worship Your holy. in love and you're slow to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness I will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find I worship you Lord Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, and sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Come on, declare it. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Come on. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Forevermore I worship you, Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. And worship his 
say this mountain can't be moved. They say these chains will never break. But they don't know you like we do. There is power in your name. We've heard that there Tides will never change. They haven't seen what you can do. There is power in your name. So much power in your name. Move the immovable, break the unbreakable.
faith rise as we just continue to sing to Jesus. We sing our story. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into night and through the darkness your love and kindness tore through the shadow of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of angels stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross the cross has spoken I am forgiven, the King of Kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. So we sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, that's the truth today. Sing it again. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to break.
Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. Give her mercy, you're my help in time of need. So Lord, I, I can't help but sing. Oh, the Lord's faithful. Faithful you are. Faithful forever you will be. Faithful you are. Here's the promise. And all your promises are yes and amen. Do you believe that today? All your promises are yes and amen. You who have broken every curse, blessed Redeemer, you who have set this captive free. So, Lord, I can't help but sing. Standing on those. Cause all your promises are yes and amen. Faithful you are. Faithful forever you will be. Faithful you are. Cause all promises cause my confidence is your faithfulness and I will rest, I'm gonna rest in your promises cause my confidence it's not in me, no it's your faithfulness and I will rest in your promises my confidence is your faithfulness, and I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness.
11 o'clock. You guys can have a seat. Uh, man, I got to tell you, it sounds so great to hear your voices this morning. I can just hear you singing so loud, and what an encouragement it is to me. And I always think this, if it's this enjoyable for us, imagine what it's like for the object of our worship. I believe it's true when the psalmist says that he bends an ear to hear the worship and the sacrifice of praise of his people. Amen? Amen. Thank you for that. Hey, if this is your first time here at Westridge, we want you to know that you are a very special guest. We're honored that you'd be with us here today. If you're watching online, very much the same. So happy to have you with us in that way as well. We would love to know um, that you're here, um, and we'd love to just reach out to you and tell you some of the things that are happening here um, in our church as a family. And so if you will take that Get Connected card out of the seat back in front of you. If you're watching online, uh, that Get Connected card is available on our app. And just fill it out and hold on to it here or submit it there on the app. And let us know that you're here. And we, again, would love to reach out and tell you some things that are happening. Whether it's your first time or maybe you've just kind of getting comfortable here. You've been here for a few weeks, but you've never had the opportunity to get involved with our Get Connected, I'm sorry, with our Next Steps class. Our Next Steps class is a great experience where you'll get to hear kind of where we've been as a church, where we believe God is taking us, and how we can journey together in what God has for us as a mission together as a family. We'd love for you uh, to um, get involved in that, and you can let us know if you're interested in that in, in, that, in our um, Get Connected card as well. Well, we are so excited because we are looking into the fall and all the great things that God has planned for us that is on our heart. And so over the last couple of weeks, we have been just highlighting a couple of areas where you can engage, become part of Team Westridge here, become a team member here. And uh, so this, this morning, I wanted just to take the opportunity for all of us to focus a little bit on our worship and production team. And Pastor Jason Chandler leads that area. Yeah, it's one of our favorites. And so I just wanted to give you a chance to tell us a little bit about it and how uh, we can connect to the production team or the worship team. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it, it starts, obviously, with the worship team. That's kind of a little bit more of the, the visual team that you see, the band, the vocalists. But our production team, when we're talking about that, we're talking about anything that is audio or lighting. And then we also have a video team, which is our broadcast video that happens on Sunday morning, but it also captures stories and does so many cool things throughout the week as well. And then for our communications team, we have a photography team um, that's capturing services, capturing moments at events. And here's what I think is pretty awesome, is throughout the entire church, all of these areas serve and support. I, I call all of these ministries a support ministry. We come alongside Pastor Brian. We come alongside the pastors throughout the ministries and help play a part. But what I love that's a unifying factor for all of us, all of the teams, no matter what role we serve in, we've kind of adopted this motto of put Jesus on display. You see it on a lot of the shirts that we have, but we remind ourselves of that because no matter if it's on platform, it's behind the camera, no matter where we are, we're putting Jesus on display. So we would love to talk to you. We're going to be out in the, in the atrium after service if you'd love to ask any questions. But a really easy next step is the Get Connected card on the seat behind you. Wow, that's awesome. Hey, whether you are giving your time and the gift that God has given you to the church, or maybe you're giving your tithes and offerings, we just want to tell you that we're so grateful for the support that you have of the ministry and the vision that God has given us here as a family. If you want to get engaged in that and be involved in that, you've never had the opportunity to do that. This morning, we do that in three different ways here as a family. We can do it, we can do it through our, um, our website, through our app, or um, through the mail, whether you're watching online or you're here in the room as well. But if you here, are here, you can also give at the door on your way out. Well, I'm excited about our teaching time this morning. Blake Odgers is here to teach us today, and we're really excited about that. Listen. That's right. This is our young adult group up here cheering for him because he is the director of our young adult ministry here. He is also our church planting resident, and he and Katie are planning to go out and start a church, to plant a church over this next year, and so we're excited about that. I want to invite you to just to be praying uh, for Blake and Katie as they prepare for that. I think they would love it to know that you have put them on your prayer list. Um, but so we're really excited about that. And as a, a way of preparation, we want to just read the text that he's going to be preaching from today. And so I want to invite you to stand with me 
as we prepare our heart and our mind um, for this, as we read God's word together. Um, I'm going to be reading it out loud, and you can read it out loud with me. We're in Mark chapter 8, um, beginning with verse 34 through chapter 9, verse 1. Let's read it out loud together. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whatever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in glory of his Father and of the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. May God bless his word. Amen. Amen. Hey, everybody. As you find your seat, let's welcome Blake Odgers as he comes to speak. Everybody, come on. What's up, church? How we doing? Let's go. My crew up here. Appreciate y'all. Um, so, first and foremost, um, I just want to give it up for our worship team. Can we thank them one time? I, it's, it's not very often that you get to worship like with a stank face on, you know? You're like, that's good, you know? And, uh, but that's exactly what we got to do this morning because they're awesome. Um, so before we dive in, obviously you saw as we, as we read together, super light passage today. Um, that <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, before we, before we dive in, I do just want to take a moment just to say uh, how grateful I am. One, uh, for this opportunity, I think it's, it's an honor and a privilege anytime you get, to, you get to teach God's word in any setting, but it just means something more when you get to do it at home and you get to do it with family. And so I'm thankful uh, to be here. I'm grateful uh, to be able to, to stand right here and, and to preach God's word uh, with family. And so, uh, so thank you for having me too. Um, I want to thank you because this has been home since 2017, but as Steve said, I've been on staff here since 2020. And so in a very real way, um, I've grown up here uh, kind of, kind of in, as an adult. My wife, Katie, has literally grown up here uh, her entire life. She's how I got here. Uh, every great story uh, well, because of a woman. Um, so she's how I got here. But, um, but I do want to thank you because you've seen us get married. We got married in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I don't suggest another pandemic, but it was a really cheap wedding. Um, and so we got married in 2020. Uh, that was awesome. And eight weeks ago, we just welcomed our son, Asa James. I think we've got a, there we go. There's the crew. Um, so yeah, I'm standing up here with a ton of sleep and a lot of energy. Um, you should have a baby. It's awesome. Um, it is. We love him. He's beautiful. He's a gift from God. And so, but we just want to thank you guys for, for loving on us, um, not only now in the middle of, of where we're at, but also just over the, over the past few years. So, so anyway, um, y'all ready to dive into the text for this morning? All right. How many of you have been enjoying this, this uh, series through the Gospel of Mark? It's been awesome. Um, so today we're continuing in that same series as you just heard, and, uh, and we do have a lot of text to work through. So I want to go ahead and warn you, uh, on your notes, uh, there are going to be things on there that we may get to, we may not get to, because um, there's a lot to work through. But I will encourage you that if you go to the Westridge app, uh, there's a notes tab all of those blanks are filled in. And so whatever we don't get to, they're there. Uh, or you can also go to westridge.com slash notes and they're there as well. Um, all right, let's pray together and then, and then we'll get going. Heavenly Father God, uh, we just wanna posture ourselves in a place of need. Uh, God, because that's where we're at. Lord, we need you. God, we are here um, for you. And God, we don't, we don't need uh, just an emotional espresso shot. We don't need um, just some Hallmark card encouragement. Lord, we need power. And so, Father, we ask you in the name of Jesus, would you pour out your spirit in this place? Would you 
impact us by the power of your word. And Lord, may we all walk out of here more like Jesus and more in love with Jesus than we were when we walked in. And it's in his name. Everybody said, amen. So last week, we worked through the context of this passage, and we're just going to take a moment and briefly revisit it because I think it's important for the text that we're, that we're working through this morning. Uh, so Jesus is with his disciples in the region of Caesarea Philippi, and in the background of their kind of meeting that they're having here are temples of idol worship. Uh, there are Roman gods, Hellenistic gods that, 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 that are They've built these beautiful temples of idol worship there. And so it's in the shadow of those that Jesus and his disciples sit. And Jesus begins to have a conversation with them. And he says, he asks them, who do you say that I am? A very vital question that all of us have to answer. But Jesus says, who do you say that I am? To which, of course, Peter responds. And he says, you are the Messiah. Some of the translations of your text may say you are the Christ. And this is the first time in the narrative of Mark that Jesus is openly referred to as the Christ. Now, what happened next in this conversation proved that although Peter called Jesus the Christ, and although Peter called Jesus the Messiah, and I think in a very real way believed him to be that, what we see in the next exchange proves that that Peter doesn't really understand who the Messiah is and, and what the role the Messiah plays. He doesn't He doesn't understand what God is really up to through the Messiah because Jesus, right after he's referred to as the Messiah, he affirms that and he he then tells them that as the Messiah, the anointed one, that he was going to suffer. He was going to be rejected. He was going to be killed. And then he would rise again. And then after Jesus states this about what the Messiah is going to have to do, Peter rebukes him. Peter actually rebukes Jesus. Now, why did Peter rebuke Jesus? It's because what Jesus was saying didn't align with the dream, the plan, the vision, and expectation that Peter had. That in Peter's mind, the Messiah was coming to rescue Israel from Rome via hostile takeover and set up an earthly government where his disciples, but most importantly, Peter, could have power, riches, and influence. No longer would Peter just be the lowly fisherman, but he would be right alongside the Messiah in power, with influence. And what Jesus was saying put everything that Peter hoped to accomplish and become at risk. And Peter knew that, and he didn't like that. Because he knew that if the Messiah suffered and had to be rejected and had to be killed, that ultimately that meant Peter would be in jeopardy as well, and he didn't like that. You see, when we don't understand what God is up to in the world and throughout human history, we will make the wrong assumptions and pursue the wrong things. We won't understand our role in the grand story because we don't know or understand the grand story. And this is Peter in this moment. He doesn't understand what's going on. He doesn't understand the story that that God is telling throughout all of history. He has these expectations, and then he makes these false assumptions, and Jesus just absolutely destroyed all of that. And so we have to ask ourselves today, what is God up to in the world and throughout humanity, or we're going to make the same mistake? And so the first thing that God is up to in the world and throughout humanity is the reconciliation of humanity to God. The reconciliation of humanity to God. You see, in the garden, we see uh, man and female made in God's image and, and there to enjoy intimacy with God. But then we see sin enter the picture, and it fractures that relationship, And ever since then, man has been trying to work their way up to God or to become God, but the reality is that God had to come to us, that God had to save us. And this is what happens in and through Jesus, that we are able to be reconciled to God by grace through faith in Jesus. But then the beauty of this is that we read in 2 Corinthians 5 that when we follow Jesus and we are filled with his spirit, that we are actually given the ministry of reconciliation that we become his ambassadors in a world that is separated from God and that we are able to call out to the people, to humanity, and say, you can be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. And this is one of the main things that God has been up to since the very beginning. This is one of the main things that Jesus came to provide a way into, and this is one of the main things that we are invited to partake and participate in. Secondly, is the restoration of God's image in us. You see, not only did sin fracture our relationship with God, but sin actually fractured us. 
that we right now are only a shell of what we were always meant to be. That God said when he made male and female in his image, they were made to be like him. And then he calls them and commissions them. He says, I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. And I want you to rule and reign and have dominion over the earth. And what he's saying there is he's inviting them to say, you are a representative of my glory and my likeness and my character. And I want you to spread this throughout the world. But when sin came into the picture, they were broken. And they no longer, they no longer exemplified God the way that they were made to. And so we see all throughout the Old Testament this constant this constant pursuit for them to try to regain that. But the problem is, is that, is that Adam and Eve fail. Abraham fails. Israel fails. Every king, prophet, and leader fails until we get to Jesus. And where every single one of them fail, Jesus doesn't fail. Jesus perfectly exemplifies the Father. He says, if you've seen me, then you've seen the Father. He shows us exactly who God is like because he is God. And by grace through faith in Jesus, we can actually have this image of God restored in us as we are conformed to his likeness over time. Once again, this is God's plan, Jesus' provision, our purpose. And third, we see the redemption of all creation. That not only was humanity's relationship with God fractured, not only were we fractured in and of ourselves, but all of, all of creation is actually broken and fractured. That which God made good and called good was broken. And now even creation longs to be renewed and longs to be redeemed. This is why you can walk out in the world today and experience and see brokenness. In Romans 8, Paul actually tells us that creation groans and longs to be redeemed and to be renewed. And the beauty of this is that Jesus ushered in the kingdom of heaven and he began and initiated the great reversal that was going to take place throughout humanity so that never, never again in the days ahead will creation be more broken than it currently is because the kingdom of heaven has been brought and Jesus will redeem it and we can actually be participants and partake in this responsibility here and now. Not fully, but actually, knowing that when Jesus comes back to finalize and complete what he has begun, that everything will be finished fully and finally, and he will rule, and he will reign, and all things will be redeemed. And this is what we are invited into. This has always been God's plan. This was always what Jesus came to set forth and provide a way into. And this is now the purpose we are invited to partake and participate in. And this is what Jesus is trying to get Peter's eyes up to see and understand. He's saying, he's saying Peter, you're concerned with these little things of man. And I'm trying to get your eyes up to see the big story that God is telling in the world and throughout human history and where you can actually play a role in all of this. You see, Peter's problem wasn't that his vision was too big for God, but that it was too small. Rather than the grand narrative of God's story throughout human history, he was focused on his tiny, little, small life. You see, the reality is the Messiah, Jesus Christ, he wasn't coming to rescue Israel from Rome and set up an earthly government. No, he had come to rescue the whole world and usher in his heavenly kingdom. And so Jesus rebukes Peter to get his eyes off of himself and onto what God is doing. And I think he's doing the same thing with us today. To get our eyes up. And he tells Peter, you're concerned with the little things of man, but God is doing something so much bigger and so much better. And so what's the problem? Why do we struggle to get aligned with what God's doing? Why do we struggle to live our lives according to what he's doing in the world and to find our place within the story? Well, Jesus actually diagnoses it here in the text. He says, he says what's the problem? You are. You're the problem. You see, often the greatest source of opposition in your discipleship to Jesus is you. And often the greatest source of opposition in my discipleship to Jesus is me. It's self. Why? Because we're, feel, we're filled with all kinds of fears and desires, some of which are leading us more into what God wants for us, more into what's best for us, or further away from what God wants for, for us, and further away from what's best for us. You see, the picture that the brother, of, the brother of Jesus, James, actually paints in his book later on in Scripture is that we are people with, that we are double-minded people with divided loyalties. The picture there in the Greek is actually someone trying to have two souls. That there is a part in us that is so deep that desperately wants to seek after our own good. And then there's a part of us that also knows 
that there's a better way, but that it's going to cost us. So the question for us this morning is how do we overcome this opposition of self and embrace our role in God's grand story? Jesus gives us three things, and he says, first of all, you've got to deny yourself. You've got to deny yourself. You see, the fact of the matter is that we ultimately, we have to deny something. We have to. We cannot serve two masters. We can't worship God and pursue his will while prioritizing self and pursuing our own will at the same time. They will eventually butt heads. There will be a moment where you want to go this way and God is calling you to go that way and you're going to have to make a decision. You're going to have to deny something and if you don't deny yourself, you will inevitably deny Jesus, which is what we see Peter do later on. You see, in this text, Jesus actually tells him in verse 33, you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And the phrase setting your mind literally means to direct your attention, to seek after, to pursue. And so what he's talking about here is, Peter, this isn't just some idle thing that's happening in you. You are actually directing your gaze and pursuing after something that is not my will for you. And I'm telling you that you need to get behind me because you're seeking after the things of man, not the things of God. And so the question for us is, what are the things of man that Jesus is referring to? In, in Mark chapter 4, he tells a parable called the parable of the sower and the, or, or the parable of the soils. And, and we see him talk, talk in verse 19 and say, here are some things that can choke out the life of the kingdom in you. He says, it's the cares of this world. It's the deceitfulness of riches. And it's the desire for other things. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things. It's interesting. You see, the reality is Satan doesn't really care how it is that you don't follow Jesus. Right? He's not committed to a methodology or strategy for lukewarmness. Whatever will make you lukewarm and stifle the spiritual power and intimacy with Jesus in your life, he will use that. And he often doesn't have to overpower us with demonic forces or destroy our lives with some egregious sin and embarrassing downfall. He simply clears the way for us to be lulled to sleep over, over, in, over infatuation with ourselves and the things of this world. Often all he has to do is clear the way for us to get exactly what many of us want. And the self is often happy to oblige. And so, and so Jesus knowing this about us, says you're going to have to deny yourself. Dallas Willard makes the note, he says that Jesus consistently alerts us to the two main things that will block or hinder a life constantly interactive with God and healthy growth in the kingdom. He says these are the desire to have the approval of others and the desire to secure ourselves by means of material wealth. If we allow them to, these two desires will pull us out of the sway of the kingdom. He says, look, the things that Jesus warns us the most about throughout the Gospels, he said it's not all of these egregious cultural issues that we distract ourselves with. It's not their sin over there or their thing over there. He said often it's, it's the stuff within us that just wants to please other people and get wealthy so that we can be comfortable. And ultimately, this stems from a lack of trust in God and the sense that we need to self-protect and self-satisfy because he's not good enough to take care of us. St. Ignatius of Loyola, he actually made the comment that sin is simply the resistance or the unwillingness to believe that what God wants most for me is my deepest happiness. And because he's not for me, I've gotta be for myself, and so I'm gonna go out of his bounds to protect myself and satisfy myself. You see, self-denial is the conscious decision to remove yourself as the central figure of your life. This is the natural response to seeing Jesus as the central figure of history and of the universe. The reality is we must be awed out of our distraction with the world. We must be awed out of the prioritization of self. That we've gotta see something more beautiful and more worthwhile than me. Tim Keller, he wrote that when we behold the glory of Christ in the gospel, it reorders the loves of our hearts so we delight in him supremely. And the other things that have ruled our lives lose their enslaving power over us. 
You see, the reality is if you're trying to hold on to yourself at the expense of greater intimacy and experience with Jesus, it's only because you haven't truly seen him. Or if you have, that you've forgotten. That your gaze has been blocked. Because the reality is, is that Jesus is worthy to be the center of our lives. Why? Because Jesus is already the center of the universe and the center of human history. Maybe you've forgotten what he looks like, or maybe you've never truly met him. Colossians 1, Paul writes about this Jesus, and he says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body. He is the head of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. He might be priority. He might be most important. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Who is this Jesus? Hebrews 1 says he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. The reason the earth spins and the universe stays put is because Jesus said stay. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Of the Son of God, of the Son, God says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. That's Jesus. You see, Jesus isn't just a nice guy. He isn't just a teacher. He isn't just a religious mascot. He's God. And he's by whom, through whom, and for whom all things have been created, including you and including me. He sits enthroned in the heavens and his kingdom will never end. You see, the weight of the call depends on the worth of the caller. And he is worthy. He's worthy. And so... A question that we have to consider in response to this is this. Is God a means for you to advance your agenda through him like he was for Peter? Or are you a means for God to advance his agenda through you? Does God exist for you or do we exist for him? You see, the reality is when we choose to follow Jesus, our entire identity and worldview should change. We don't add him to our lives. He becomes enthroned over our lives. In the words of Pastor Mike Kelsey, you will never experience what Jesus wants you to by simply adding him to the life you already decided to live. We must deny ourselves and place Jesus at the center. And not only must we, but we should want to. What else are you gonna put there? Your kids can't carry that weight. Your job can't carry that weight. Your bank account can't carry that weight. Only Jesus can. And here's the good news. He wants to. He wants to. <laughs> Second, you got to take up your cross. You got to take up your cross. Why must we take up our cross? Because there's going to be resistance in our pursuit of Christ in his way. That if you follow Jesus, if you deny yourself and make him the central figure in your life, there was going to be resistance. Who are we going to face resistance from? Well, first of all, there's an enemy. That we have an enemy who is actively opposed to God. And so if we are following Jesus, if we are surrendered to God, if he's the central point of our lives and we're committing our way to him, then guess what? He's going to actively oppose you. He's gonna actively oppose you, that we can't be surprised when we get attacked. See, the fact of the matter is that he is seeking to steal from you, to devour you, to destroy you, and he uses deception to do it. Jesus actually refers to him as the father of lies. So how does he do this? He will give you many shiny good things to distract you from the one thing that can actually give you life. 
He uses deception. After the enemy, we, we have the culture, which our pastor preached about last week. And so I'm not gonna hit on this too long, but the culture is just the ways of the world, the systems in the world that are underneath the dominion of darkness and resistant to the way of Jesus. And the fact of the matter is that the culture has a direct line to everyone in this room who has a smartphone or social media. That we are being impacted by the culture in more ways than we probably understand or take note of. However, there's also another culture that I wanna warn us of, and that's the religious culture or church culture. You see, this kind of culture says that that we don't ultimately have to be obedient to Jesus so long as, as we give him 70 minutes a week and we, we don't cuss too much and we try to behave real good. And, and the fact of the matter is, is that I think there's many of us who were tempted to ride the bench our entire lives and then stand before God and expect that that our lives have left a ripple effect in eternity and that we're gonna hear well done. See, but the, the reality is, and I want you to listen, anyone, anyone who offers a commitment-free, sacrifice-free, and suffering-free path to following Jesus isn't offering you biblical Christianity. They're not. Maybe they've got the best intentions for you, but it's just not reality. And Jesus is too kind and he loves you too much to let you live an existence that isn't aligned with the ultimate reality of who he is and what he's done and what he's calling you to do and what he's doing in the world and the grand story that he's telling. You see, cross-bearing is a lifestyle of participation in Christ's suffering and sacrifice for the sake of Christ's mission. And what is Christ's mission? He says it in many different ways, but in John 10, 10, he says, I've come that you may have life and have life to the full that you may have life to the full, that your family may have life to the full, that your neighbors may have life to the full, that our city and our community and our country and our world may have life to the full. And what Jesus is saying here is that if we want to see life take ground on death, if we wanna see light take ground on darkness, then it's going to require something of us. So what did, a, what did a cross represent, right? We sing about the cross now. We get tattoos of the cross. We wear the cross. We love the cross. It's beautiful now. But it wasn't in this moment as Jesus is talking about the cross. Jesus hasn't yet gone to it. And so when he mentions the cross, you can just sense that there's, a, there's, a, there's just a, a recoil from the disciples. Because what did a cross represent? It represented shame, discomfort, pain. And so a very real question that we have to ask ourselves is where are there opportunities in our lives to embrace shame, discomfort, or pain for the sake of Jesus? And this is different for all of us because discipleship is a journey and we're all, we're all in different spaces in our journey with Jesus. So maybe there are some of you in the room, your parents, and you've never been shown what it looks like to lead your family spiritually. You have no idea. And you've got so much shame and discomfort, maybe even anxiety and fear when it comes to leading your family. It feels awkward to pray with your spouse. You feel embarrassed to try to disciple your kids and try to have hard conversations so you just embrace passivity and you don't do it. Maybe there's some young people in here who are standing at a crossroads Maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's a decision, maybe it's your future, and you are quite literally having to decide between going this way with God or going the other way. Maybe there are some attenders in here who have long since God calling you into greater commitment, greater service or leadership, but you've been resistant because you want control of your time and life. Maybe there are some leaders, young and old in here, who have sensed God calling them into full-time ministry or missional service, but you haven't because you're scared, you're worried. Maybe there's someone in here who's totally resistant to Jesus and the cross you've got to take up is quite literally crucifying your pride and surrendering to Jesus today. Whoever you are and wherever you are, there's a greater step you can take for the sake of Jesus. And then lastly, is just follow Jesus. Is just follow Jesus. Jesus, when Jesus, when a rabbi would call people to follow him, it literally meant, I want you to walk with me. I want you to attach yourself to me. 
I want you to watch me. I want you to live life with me. I want you to walk in my steps. I want you to do what I do so that ultimately you can become like me. So we just follow Jesus. That the way that we are conformed to the image of Jesus, that his image is restored in us, the way that we get to participate in the work of God, the reconciliation of humanity to God, the way that we get to see the redemption of all creation is, is, is we follow Jesus. We follow Jesus in our workplaces. We follow Jesus in our homes. We follow Jesus in our community. We just follow Jesus. You see, the beauty of this life is that we can actually be with Jesus and become like him. That yes, he came to show us the Father. He came to show us what God is like, but he also came to show us what we were always meant to be. Discipleship to Jesus is simply an invitation to become who we were always meant to be so that God can fulfill his purposes in and through us. And the beauty of this is that Jesus isn't asking us to just do something separate from him. He's not saying, hey, I need you to go do all these things. Go deny yourself. Go take up your cross. And when you've got it figured out, come let me know and maybe I'll let you in. He's saying, guess what? For the sake of my father and for the sake of you, for the joy that was set before me, I denied myself. I took up my cross and I obeyed and I want you to come with me. That we have a companion, we have a leader, we have a Lord. You see, God actually longs to partner with us and dispense his power through us. But the reality is, is that his power is inextricably linked to his purposes. That if you want his power in your life, You've got to live for his purposes. Why would God empower us for something that's not him? He's, you just have to imagine God sitting on the edge of his seat going, I want to pour my power out on you. I want to. God, I want to bless you. I want to give myself to you. I want to attach my life to you you got to come with me. you got to come with me. you got to stop being distracted by these other things. you got to come with me. N.T. Wright wrote, he said, the spirit is given so that we ordinary mortals can become in a measure what Jesus himself was, part of God's future arriving in the present, a place where heaven and earth meet, the means of God's kingdom going ahead. The Spirit is given, in fact, so that the church can share in the life and continuing work of Jesus himself. What an invitation. You can become like him. You can participate in his work. And as we bring it to a close, there's, there's a few things that Jesus says in the latter part of this that I don't wanna miss. He's actually kind enough to give us reasons. He doesn't say, just do this. He says, do this and here's why. You'll notice that there's four statements that begin with the word for. Those are his reasons. And the first of which is that your life is purposeful. In verse 35, he says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Your life has a purpose that it's meant to achieve an aim. That if you're here and you're wandering and you, you don't know what you're called to do, you don't know who you're called to be, your life is purposeful. It's meant to be attached to him for his sake, for the gospel's sake, the good news, that there's a God who loves people and that Jesus has come and he's made a way for people to live in him, that he's ushered in his kingdom and redemption is on the way. That in a, in a sense, it's already here. It's in the already but not yet, that it's gonna come fully and finally. And we get the joy and the privilege to continue to usher it forward. Your life has purpose, your life is purposeful. Second, that your soul is valuable. Your soul is valuable. Verse 36 and 37, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What can a man give in return for his soul? Jesus is literally saying, you don't think highly enough of yourself. 
that your soul is so valuable that the things of this world are like holding a candle to the sun, that there's more for you. You're meant for more than wealth and comfort. That your soul is valuable, it's precious. Third, judgment is inevitable. He says, whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the son of man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father with the holy angels. That all of us are gonna have to stand before God at the end of our lives and give an account. And yes, if you're in Christ, that means you're justified by grace through faith in him. That if you've really placed your faith and trust in him, that Jesus is faithful to say, I've paid for all of that, but you're still gonna have to stand there as your life is read out. And don't you wanna stand there and know that you gave every single bit of your life for the things that matter most? Fourth, he says, the kingdom is eternal. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. There's people who have different opinions on what Jesus is talking about in this moment. Some people think he's referring to the transfiguration, which we're gonna talk about next week. Some people think he's talking about his second coming. But notice he says, you're gonna be there. You're gonna be standing there. And he's talking to his disciples. And what I believe Jesus is saying is that you're going to see the son of man suffer, be rejected, die and raise again. And you're gonna see me with all authority on earth and in heaven, in my hands. And you're gonna see it. You're gonna see it. And we get to live on the other side of that. We don't have to live in the tension of did he do it or did he not? The kingdom is eternal. So as you live your life attached to the kingdom, you know that you're not living for things that are gonna pass away and be burnt up. You're living for things that are gonna ripple throughout eternity. And every investment you make in God and his kingdom will not fade away. They won't, they can't. And then last but not least, it's all wrapped up in this, is that Jesus is incredible. You know that our phrase throughout this series has been Jesus is incredible and he's worth following with your whole life. But let me tell you something, Jesus is incredible because Jesus is credible. In 1 Corinthians 15, the apostle Paul tells us that if Jesus Christ has not risen from the dead, then we are of all, we are most of all to be pitied. We are wasting our time. But then he continues and he says, but in fact, he has been risen from the dead. And because he's been risen from the dead, we too shall be raised. Because Jesus is credible, because Jesus is who he says he is, because he's done what he's promised to do, we can throw our lives on him and know that it won't be wasted. That we can actually see the reconciliation of humanity to God, the restoration of God's image in us and the redemption of all creation. In part, but actually, but in part, here and now, but fully and finally when we see that incredible Jesus redeem all things for the glory of his name. A question that we must ask ourselves today because when we look at this text, our attention is automatically drawn to the cost and to the demand. But I think a more important question for us is not only what's the cost of following Jesus, but what's the cost if we don't? What's the cost if we don't? What's the cost to your family? What's the cost to our community? What's the cost to the world? What's the cost to the future generations? What's the cost to your life? Aren't you tired of living for the things of man, living this small story? Let's embrace our role in God's grand story and lead others into that grand story that they may receive life every head bowed and every eye closed. Listen to me, I, I know that this is hard. I know that we're reading this text and, and there's a demand here and it feels like it's so much and I get it, trust is hard. We've been hurt, we've been let down and there's a lot within us that's resistant to this and we just think within our minds, if I can maintain control of my life, I know that I can make it work. 
But Jesus is saying, no. Entrust yourself to me. Entrust your life to me. And you'll experience the life that you've always dreamed of, that you long for, that it may not make sense in some moments, but I promise you that at the end of your life, you're gonna look back and say, that mattered. That mattered. And the enemy's gonna try to convince you that God is holding out on you, that he doesn't have your best at heart, and that if you trust him, he's gonna let you down, but listen to me. The cross is proof that God is willing to go to any length necessary for you to experience the fullness of life. You can't look at the cross and say that that's a God who holds out on his people. No, you can trust him. You can trust him. Hebrews 12 tells us to consider Jesus. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. Why? So that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your own blood. You can trust him. Consider Jesus. Consider Jesus. There are some of you in here who have never responded to this Jesus. You've never placed your faith and trust in him. You're here and you're holding on to your life with white knuckles. Listen to me. He has done everything necessary to secure your place. And he will fill you with his spirit. He will give you a grand purpose. He will seat you with him in the heavenly places. All it takes is repentance and faith you to turn away from yourself and entrust yourself to him. If that's you today and you want to make that decision, would you pray with me? Father, I see it. I see it. I see you for who you are. And because I see you for who you are, I see myself for who I am. I'm someone who needs to be saved. God, I thank you for providing Jesus as the way for me to be made right with you. Right now, I put all my faith and all my trust in him. Thank you for saving me. I give you my life. I give you my heart. All that I am and all that I have is yours. Would you take it? Would you use it for what matters most? In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to stand as we sing our way out of here. There are some of you here who have, who if you're honest, you've, this is not where you're at right now. That you've been distracted by the things of this world. Maybe it was who you used to be. It was something that you've done before. But right now, we're gonna sing a song that gives you the permission to sing your soul back into belief and to sing yourself back into alignment with God. Some of you, you need to come to the steps. You need to have somebody pray with you or pray over you because you need to repent. You need to recommit. You need to give your life back to Jesus. You need to get your life back into alignment with him. We wanna invite you to do that. Whatever you need in this moment, whatever you need in this moment, do it. Let's sing together. I give you my life. I give you my trust. Jesus. You are my God, you are enough, Jesus, Jesus, my heart is yours, my heart is yours, take it all, take it all. My life in your hands, my heart is yours, my heart is yours, take it all, take it all, my life in your hands.
is your song of surrender, church. Lift it up. All to Jesus. All to Jesus I surrender to you are free. I will ever love and trust you. Just encourage Blake Autos. This last Wednesday, I had the opportunity to sit with him and go over his talk with him. And I just knew that this morning was going to be a powerful morning for us. Great worship, great word. Thank you so much um, for being here. If you made a spiritual decision of any kind, we'd love for you. I would invite you to take that Get Connected card or fill it out online and let us know about that because our hope and our joy and what we have been praying for is that we might be able as family members to come alongside you and be an encouragement in any way that we can. So do that and you can uh, hand it in at the doors on your way out or again you can fill it out on our app. What's well, been a great morning. We're so glad you've been able to be here with us. We're looking forward to, um, to next Sunday and a great week of ministry until then. So have a great afternoon and a great week. We'll see you then. Okay, church?